presents Movies Till Dawn for your late night entertainment. Tonight, heaven can wait. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating, and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFolita, and today I'm Jewish. I want you to hear part two of a conversation I had with my friend Griffin Dunn. Griffin comes from a, a very interesting family. If you don't know this, I'll, I'll, I'll sketch it in quickly. Uh, his father was Dominic Dunn, and Dominic Dunn, is, of course, was a best-selling novelist, a very distinguished investigative reporter, um, very involved with the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, but he was also a movie producer, or mostly a television producer, according to Griffin. Um, it, was, it was an interesting life that, that his father had, and his father's brother, John Gregory Dunn, was a marvelous novelist. Uh, and we talk a little bit about in this interview about John Gregory Dunn's novels, which I've loved. Just to make it even more impressive, John Gregory Dunn was married to Joan Didion. And I can't tell you about Joan Didion if you don't know her, look her up. I mean, of course you know her. She's Joan Didion. She's amazing. And Griffin made a wonderful movie about Joan Didion, um, which you can find. It was not yet finished when we recorded this this conversation. Um, but but Griffin comes from a lot of that kind of accomplishment and a lot of that seriousness, and yet one of the things I love about Griffin is it's all very light with him. He takes it all with a wonderful grain of salt, and I think it comes across in this interview. You did uh, you produced but did not act in one of my favorite films, Running on Empty. Mm -hmm. Sidney Lumet directed it. Naomi Foner wrote it, right? Uh, River Phoenix was what, maybe 14 in this movie? Yeah. Uh, um, no more like 16, but he was emancipated, so we like shot really grown-up hours and everything. Had you? Did you guys find the script? Did you put no, it but, together? Or? No, well, Amy and I had wanted to, we were really interested in what became of who was left underground from the weathermen and, and, and various, you know, radical groups that had, had just disappeared. And, and, you know, the Brinks robbery had happened and, you know, Patty Hearst, of course, had happened. There was like a, there was still this sort of underground fringe left. I fear that they might be called the alt left okay. coming up, <laughs> um, which I, I, I kind of, but that's another story. Uh, it's another worry, rather. But at that time, there was a radical left, right? And we read, it must have been about a two-inch article in, in, in the paper about the kids, these kids growing up. Their parents had left, abandoned them um, with, with some other family, not knowing what their kids, what their parents quite did or being old enough to quite understand it. And uh, it just sparked so many thoughts and story idea and we were very interested in it from the kids point of view and and, and it was, we were attracted to the family side of it and uh, so we we talked with different writers about it and um, we talked with Naomi who couldn't have been more of a perfect person to do it and she was a red diaper baby from the Upper West Side and right. grew up like that we um, you know, did the normal pitching and a company called Lorimar. Bernie Brillstein was running it. He gave us a development deal. And then we went and uh, went after, made director's lists. And Sidney was, of course, right there. Mm -hmm. And we went to his house, just Amy and I, and he wanted to see if we get along. And he loved the script. And he also knew this would be another one because we were suddenly associated if it was really cheap and... <laughs> quick to make you get punished for making bringing movies in on time sometimes you mm -hmm. know well he was he was famous well he could do for, it for coming in under for coming in yeah. under you know Ron Silver used to say to him you know because he'd only do one or two takes at most with the actors and he'd go Sidney let, let me try I can do this in less than a take it was just that he was that fast and I think he was the only director Amy and I ever said you know we're not in that big of a hurry. <laughs> 20 years ago, his parents protested the Vietnam War. I was wondering if Michael had ever mentioned anything to you about his old school. I'm a liar. My name isn't Michael. My parents are Arthur and Annie Pope. My God, Annie, why'd you throw it all away? 
a story of love, loyalty, and letting go. Running on Empty, directed by Sidney Lumet. He was one of those guys that you just... I wasn't thinking about being a director at the time, but I realize now I was so influenced by him. So many things... By Lumet. I, yeah, yeah. So many things that he did stayed with me that I learned about, and the way he talked about actors, and the way he supported them, and when he wanted to, like, get tough, and the rehearsing was, fa you know, just fascinating. He, does, you know? he did the whole... He does the tape on the ground and the dimensions of the... So when I directed my first feature, it was called Addicted to Love, I did the exact same thing. It, it becomes more and more problematic to get actors to all come in for rehearsal and work two, two weeks beforehand, and that... Right. But on, on that movie in particular, it was really, really helpful. But I liked the, uh, you know, seeing the efficiency of which he, you know, was both creative and extremely efficient. Right. And that he also does, which I do to this day, is I don't go out, I don't, I, I stay in the camper and I sleep during lunch. Yeah. And it makes all the difference. And you you knew not to knock on his door from, you know, if you're taking a half hour, hour long, whatever it is. And he'd just come back, you know, shooting out of the cannon. Right. One of the things I always admired about it is this is a story that, could have been so sentimental. Mm. It's very dry, mm -hmm. and it's it's certainly in the writing, you know, it very much in the performances. But there's something about his direction that is very almost deadpan. No, I, he, it's very uninflected. Yeah. It's very simple in a way that there's another movie that always reminds me of in that way, which is Louis Malle's um, *Au Revoir, L'Enfant*. Mm -hmm. The the camera couldn't be less obtrusive. It rarely moved. Yeah. There was, it wasn't um, it wasn't that kind of a thing. It was like the there the four people at a table, and then a, a fifth. The camera would be like where if, if there was a fifth chair, mm -hmm. and just look around, just observe. There's a devastating scene that I'll never I'll never forget. I think everyone who sees the movie always talks about the um, the wife and her father. Yeah, in the in the yeah. diner. So as I said, rehearsed. It was Stephen Hill just passed away? Uh, what about a year or so ago? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it was two cameras. I remember thinking, I'd never seen that two camera thing before. Uh, Each pointing the other, yeah. on the other actor. Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted to see that scene. I really wanted to see that. And I got hung up at the production office. And, you know, if we had like an eight o'clock call, I, I think I must have gotten there about 11 a.m. And everybody's in tears. It was so amazing. And he'd already shot the damn scene. It's all done. I missed it. <laughs> But I got there right afterwards. Yeah. I mean, there was... I've never seen a crew so affected by something. Mm. And everybody knew something unbelievably special had happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Sydney, who'd probably directed... Must have had moments like that in the past 45 years before this movie. He acted like it had never happened before. And that was kind of great to see, too. It was like... It was like fresh and new and excited and, you know, seeing somebody like that that you, you know, imbue all this experience and all, you know, from their movies, like, what could possibly, could they get it up about at this point in their life? Sure. Oh. It almost feels to me like you started to lose interest in acting around this time. Uh, or at least pursuing leads. I, I'm, I'm well, always... I, 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 I'd love to say it was that. I, I was terribly, um, I had much more perspective about material than I did about my own, like, long-range acting. I knew that I'd been in a really important movie with a really important director with the Scorsese thing. And the next move I found very, really kind of terrifying. Like, what would be my second movie? Whether it would be, you know, what would be the thing I would follow up with? And I overthought it, and I was so sort of anxious about it. And I was being, here I was, being sent... Every script, and every script was terrible. I mean, really, like, you know, a script called Mannequin. You know, it was like an 80s thing. Every bad... you got to remember, the majority of movies during the 80s were crap. Yeah. And I wanted to be like, you know, I wanted to do, you know, Woody Allen's next movie, or, you know, Jim Jarmusch, or, you know, be with the, be with the cool people. I was getting, you know, whatever big wacko Disney comedy. Yeah. You know, big, loud, brassy things with you know bad hair and and I and I and I didn't want to do it I didn't they didn't strike me as funny the way you know I was also you know spoiled rotten from having this extraordinary experience mm -hmm. and I wanted to have at least an approximation of it happening again and I chose this 
incredibly um, delicate um, time to actually then change agents and then greet the new agents by saying, you know, I'm going to do a movie. I'm going to produce a movie as my next follow-up that I'm not even going to be in. It was just downright weird, you know? <laughs> you know, I could have... They, had, I they hadn't met your uh, pr- particular brand of... No. Of leading man from a... Uh, <laughs> no, and I hadn't either. I mean, I, I had a vision of it, but I couldn't even really articulate, like, the kind of person I wanted to be. Well, I kind of I kind of did in the... And I mean this in the professional way. The the person I really idolized and was in awe of, who had the career I, I would dream of being, but I would be too shy to say it, was Warren Beatty. You know, Reds had come out. How does somebody make Reds and act like that mm-hmm. and oversee all that? I thought that was... But that felt too grandiose to say. But but there was somebody, you know, sure who could go back and forth and, and and do all these things. So I didn't wasn't represented very well at the time, and I wasn't making very good choices. And uh, and I think I was I was kind of I was really young, you know, and I was like more afraid of making. You know, when you're really afraid of making the bad choice, yeah. you're definitely going to make the bad choice. Yeah. You know, I don't think I did myself any favors also. You know, I did Who's That Girl? Madonna was certainly as famous as they come, and it was actually a really fun movie to make. But, you know, it was one of those... Well, they kind of had it out for her. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, it didn't and matter so, what that movie so was, did, it was never going to... And, 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 and I didn't... If I look back on it, I go, how could you not have known that? You were going to sure. get... That movie was going to get killed. So there was all... There was a lot of weird choices. So it wasn't like I wasn't uninterested... I just, I was more worried about doing something I didn't like. Mm -hmm. I was more worried about being stuck with, like, hacks or signing on to something that I realized was going to be terrible. Yeah. And I'd rather just, I'd rather produce, be responsible for something, you know, being good or bad and being able to pick and choose the people I want to spend the next year with, you know. Yeah, it's a fun, but choosing, you know, choosing a, a, a movie at a particular I'm in the process of, of, of working on something where I'm I'm casting, um, meeting like young up and coming kids who are like all in these movies that are, have broken out or are about to break out or all in this, and they're uh, like 18, 19, 20, up to 20, 24 uh, to play mm-hmm. an adolescent, and I don't envy them at all. You know, there's like uh, if they turn me down, I won't take it in the least bit personally because it's really like heady stuff you know it's uh, you're you're getting all this stuff coming your way and it's just as easy to make and especially now you make one movie and it's not the right movie and then people all that glow and then people see you differently and it's like oh he did that and then you're like knocked down like yeah yeah you, it's, get, it's, you really are punished it's quick quick to move on in, mm. in in the film world now when i met you you had just done your short film mm-hmm. that was nominated for an oscar so I almost wonder, like, what took you so long to want to direct a movie? Or why didn't you do that earlier? Because um, that's 1995 when we met. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now I was truly losing interest in acting, um, which was a terrible feeling. I could feel like whatever my... The, the, the kid who moved to New York to study with Sanford Meisner, I could just... That guy just it eked out of my body. Just mm-hmm. it was just you know battery fluid, and it was just. And I was in Toronto. I was making a cable movie where I was. And this is when cable was truly tacky, not like anything sexy the way it is now. Right. And I was playing a Martian or a droid. I, I wasn't even sure which, and I didn't give a shit. You know. Right. And I went, oh my god, this is like. And I would write this short movie in my in my back when I got back to my hotel. And I said, this is what I'm going to, whatever it takes, I'm going to get this this thing going. And as soon as I decided that's what I wanted to do, um, without even knowing, all the years of experience as a producer and as an actor, and it, it all just fell into place. And I realized, I know exactly how to do this. And it flowed out of me on the page. And first person I showed it to is, here's the money. First actors I went to is, yes, I'll do it. And it was... It just all fell into place, and then when I showed up on the set, it was like, why didn't I do this? I asked my, well, you just asked me, why Why didn't I do this 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I never felt so at home in my life. Hi, this is Rich. You know Cooper? Yeah. So how are you doing? I'm unbelievable. What's up? Um, well, I uh, wanted to ask you if you wanted to go check out Elton John at the Greek sometime. <laughs> What do you mean sometime? Like, we pick a day until Elton, and he shows up and plays? Do you mean like that? 
No, I mean this Saturday. You have good tickets? Well, here's the thing is, um, there's this back entrance where they wheel in the sodas and shit, and it's like never guarded. It's really you easy. You want me to sneak in with the Pepsis and the popcorn? This is too good. Jimbo, you gotta hear this. Hey, Cooper, are you trying to snake my girlfriend? Do you realize what I'm gonna do to your face tomorrow? The film has resurfaced in my life again because it's uh, it's based on a on a on a on a real party I went to when I was a kid. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, well, my aunt and uncle, who were the writers John Gregory Dunn and Joan Didion, gave a party. They were in, lived on Franklin here in here in Hollywood in this like old crumbly kind of villa. They gave this party that Janis Joplin was going to go to. And it was a party actually for Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test to just come out. Ostensibly a book party, but it was the hippie party to end all hippie parties. And I was desperate to go. And I was like 12, maybe 13. And uh, I begged my mother to take me. And to my surprise, she said yes, it was on a school night. And, I, and then I became incredibly anxious because I realized, you know, when I meet Janice, that we really hit it off. She's gonna ask, you know, where, you know, let's go somewhere. And I'll say, I can't, I'm here with my mother. <laughs> so, I mean, these are the things I worried about. While I was wandering around, I mean, I was a kid, nobody even talked to me. I just would walk around and eavesdrop and watch people sneak off into bedrooms and smoke joints and stuff. This bald German man, who I presume to be Colonel Klemp from Hogan's <laughs> Heroes, grabbed me pulled me down and said, you must not leave. I like your vibe. I take acid, I'm bumming out. I'm bumming out. You stay here, I like your vibe. And uh, it was Otto Preminger. Oh, how weird. Yeah, anyway. That's not, that's not a story you ever hear about Otto Preminger. <laughs> no, he took acid and can't you, I can't think of anyone who should let, who should have taken acid less. <laughs> I yeah. don't want to be in that mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he was hallucinating, I never want to know. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Did you read Joan Didion's work when you were growing up? Yeah. Did you grasp her, her, her uh, how massive her, her influence was going to be on that generation? Or it, It's so strange when you're related to a writer. It's not always yeah. easy to, you know, to, I would to say, see through other people's eyes. You know, I had a... Um, uh, I grew up as a very uh, troubled student. I was a uh, very dyslexic, and I had a really hard... I couldn't add, and I was like one of those people they assumed was retarded, and I was held back a year and all that stuff. Whenever an, a book of theirs came out, either John or Joan, we were always given an early copy, and it was always signed. And, and for whatever reason, both Joan's writing and John's, I could easily absorb. Now... Not for everyone. John's much easier because it had a kind of Catholic rhythm, and something I felt very related to. Not all of Joan's, Joan, some of Joan's stories were, were sort of too deep for me to absorb. But, but then others, like Slouching Towards Bethlehem, I understood that to be about, you know, about hippies in a way that I never thought of hippies before, of, of runaway kids who are like my age and incredibly fucked up parents who, you know, do drugs in front of them. And it was like, you know, riveting. Um, but then she would write a story about, you know, on self-respect, you know, about how to look at your life when you reach a certain age and you see you're not the per kind of person you thought you were going to be. And, you know, I said, Mom, I'm 12. I mean, I'm 13, 14, but I don't know what the hell she's talking about. Right. Um, but I did later. <laughs> <laughs> I find uh, John Gregory Dunn a terribly underrated writer. I couldn't I agree more. I love his novels. I, I love have... Dutch Shade Jr. I've read that several times. Yeah. It's literally like a one sitting. It's so you, funny and it, so it, emotional so, and so crazy. It's yeah. so funny. It's yeah. so funny. And he also wrote, speaking of the movie business, well, he wrote great pieces about the movie business in general. But he wrote The Studio which is exactly the time that we're talking about when I was, you know, the Dr. Doolittle years, where these studios have no idea that how irrelevant they are right? and how out of touch. And John saw that coming a mile away, and he'd sit in the room with these 
with these old producers who had no idea who their audience was. Right. Just blowing all this money left and right in these flop movies that the best part about it was the credit sequences. You know, and, and it's really funny. Yeah, no, the studio's great. It's a very, um, it's journalism, but not written from that. I, I, how do you describe the studio? Because it, it sort of reads like a wry it's the, it's Novel John's voice looking at yeah. yeah it's John's voice but it's everyone's and, in it really names names he names talks names and and you know pity the people although you know people in Hollywood they say I don't care what you write about me as long as you write about me I would think that they you would think there'd be a fatwa put out on him after this book came out but no it actually he became a screenwriter that's funny after yeah. writing these you know hilarious put downs of these of these of these people there's a there's a scene in it that is it's so painful but it's so it's so funny the the by then he must have I was going to say the old director he was probably in his 60s but uh, yeah. Henry Coster right. who had made big Deanna Durbin musicals in the 30s and 40s comes in to pitch Richard Zanuck who's then running Fox mm. on his new idea for a musical and I can't recount it but it's you know, it's 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 hopeless. It's a nineteen forty Deanna Durbin yeah. musical and the children all have to raise money for the orchestra, otherwise the little girl's gonna get sick and blah, 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 blah. so he goes through the whole pitch, he leaves the room, there's a pause, and then the last line of the chapter is Richard Zanuck said, Jesus. God. <laughs> I know. And they let him. He got Richard Zanuck to let him sit in on he, he brought a memo to every <laughs> All the departments and all the producers on the lot. And he goes, you know, John Gregory Dunn, is, if he comes to your office and you're having meetings, I'd like him to have him sit in on your meetings. He's let him be a fly on the wall. Yeah. Well, he showed them. No, I know. Who, why, why do they allow I, access I like that? Why I, did, I there's, a, there's a crazy Otto Preminger book ca- called uh, Soon to Be a Major Motion Picture mm-hmm. about one of his last films. It was called Rosebud, a, a, a catastrophe from the moment yeah. the film yeah. started, you know. And this is a very strong, powerful, intelligent personality. Why would Otto Preminger have allowed this guy to fall? And the book's another, like, it's the studio. It's the, yeah. it's a tragic comic well, you know, story of how wrong showbiz can go. Yeah. You know? And there's the uh, Bonfire of the Vanities book. Oh, about the making of the movie, about you're the right. Making yeah. of the movie. Of which Brian actually is still friends with the writer. They, they, they stayed friends. So this is cool. I love talking with you. This was nice. Good. I want to give you the, uh, uh, the opportunity to either quash a piece of internet ephemera or confirm it what this has to do with othello and the reason you were Can't kicked out of school oh yeah is that that's it, internet it's, ephemera it's, 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 it's wikipedia worthy i just no shit i i, I, I want to hear the the othello um, uh, uh well because it sounds like a griffin dunn as othello or iago even from I, the beginning I, I, yeah, and i don't understand yeah, it no i have to tell you um yeah it was this it was a, a seminal moment um i had this this kid in high school, we'd been to a previous high school. We'd been going to boarding schools, both as kids. We were both from, you know, the kind of families that send their kids, you know, thousands of miles away to school from the time they're 11. And this kid and I met when we were 11, and then we went on to this, to the high school prep school part. And it was in the high school prep school part that I got really into acting. I was like, I discovered, I did Zoo Story, and I became just the Joe actor on campus, and I loved it. And my friend had an equal passion in dope and discovered all sorts of hallucinogens and things. And and so we drifted apart because I became Joe actor, and he was, you know, Joe head. (laughs) And he came into my, and I'm rehearsing Othello. I'm playing Iago, and it is, uh, and it is really exciting. I mean, it's really like I can't, you know, I've always thought, you know, I said I had a reading problem and dyslexic. and Shakespeare's language I always found impenetrable. I just understood this, the rhythm and the big pentameter and the passion and the evil. And the, and uh, I'm really, really fucking into it. And this kid comes into my room and he's got a, like a hash pipe and he goes, uh, hey man, we never hang out. We don't get high anymore, you know, what a, you just want to do about acting and stuff like that. And he does this guilt trip. He goes, let's just take a little hit of the bowl, man. We're just going to do... I really saw John, really, I don't... I, don't. I go, you on, man. You really changed. And that, for some reason, used to be a terrible insult. So I said, okay, just give me that thing. And I take this big pole, and in walks a teacher. And the, the smoke is in my lungs. And he goes, somebody's smoking dope in here? And I go, no. <laughs> 
and this plume <laughs> come flying out of my floating out of my mouth. And you know, it was a very strict school. They were dying to kick him out. They were uh, not so crazy about me, especially since the performance was the next night. And they said, if you just say you weren't doing it and he was, you're good, and he'll go. And it was. It reminded me of, which I think came out around the same time, but it reminded me a little bit of uh, that scene in Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah. Where in their car, it's like, you're you th- going to be you fine. Think, you think I'll give up Sal? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, right. yeah, you think I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't give up Sal. Yeah. I don't know why. I just, you know, I'm not even friends with this guy anymore. But I was I was kicked out. I was on a, I was on a, I took a bus home because that's what romantic people do when they get kicked out of school. And I, and I was on a bus cross country the next day that sucks if you enjoyed listening to movies till dawn i'd love to hear from you you can email me at movies till dawn podcast at gmail.com you can access these conversations at itunes spotify tune in stitcher google podcasts soundcloud youtube as well as our website movies till dawn dot transistor dot fm if you'd like to see some videos pertaining to the guests of each episode, please visit my blog at moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. All interview material and audio clips are covered by the Fair Use Copyright Act of 1976, in which allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Music